how quickly we forget all the miracles that He has done for us in the past and we take them for granted. Remember the, the disciples when Jesus turned, uh, took five loaves and a few fishes and fed 5,000. And just a few short days later, they're in a boat crossing over the lake. And Jesus turns to the disciples and says, do you have any bread? And, and, and they, they are absolutely dumbfounded. They had forgotten completely everything that Jesus had talked to them about. Jesus said, do you not understand? Neither remember the five loaves and the five thousand and how many baskets you took up. Neither the seven loaves or the four thousand. You see, there are two occasions. Jesus said, fed five thousand one time, four thousand on another occasion. And how many baskets you took up? How is it that you don't understand? And that's a question the Holy Ghost wants to ask us tonight. When you're in a present crisis, when you need a miracle, and, and right now they needed bread. Jesus, have you brought any bread? And he was, he was really talking about something spiritual. But they were questioning among themselves, uh, where are we going to get bread to feed us and the Master? Totally forgetting this miracle. Totally forgetting what Jesus had done. And, and this is what I want the Holy Ghost to ask you and me tonight. How is it that you don't understand? In fact, in Mark 8:17. Jesus seems to be absolutely overwhelmed by how quickly they forgot this incredible miracle that they beheld. He said, having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? Don't you remember when you stood before me, all of you stood before me, and a little boy handed me five loaves and two fishes. And how many baskets did you have? They said, well, we had twelve. And did you not remember me breaking them up and filling all the baskets with bread and meat? And can you imagine how it seems so natural to them? It just, just, it, they were, they're going around and there's more bread in one basket than those five loaves in one basket. And there's 12 of them running it. They, they hand out the bread and someone's handing out the meat. They come back and Jesus keeps breaking and breaking. It had to take hours and hours and hours. It kept breaking and breaking and filling up those baskets. And it's never dawning on them. They don't even have the slightest concept of what's happening. They, they know it, but they take it for granted. And, and you would think they would, they would stop and think. Look, there were only five loaves and two fishes. And we've already passed out about 50 baskets, maybe 100 baskets, maybe 300 baskets. And, and it's, it's almost uh, laborious to them. And they should have been on their knees. They should have fallen before the master and saying, Master, you are God. Only God can do this. But they're taking it for granted. They should have been going up and down that crowd saying, Miracle bread, miracle bread. Out of five loaves and two fishes, look what he's doing. And, and they're just nonchalant. And this, this, they're not even thinking miracle. They're not even thinking God. They're just passing out bread and meat. Have eyes, and you see not, ears, and you hear not. And, 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 and it's very clear that they did not understand. You don't understand. You don't remember the deliverances of yesterday, the miracles of yesterday. You're in a crisis now, and you forgot what I did for you before. And from Genesis to Revelation, God's word literally streams out. Remember, remember what I did in the past. Go to Exodus, the 13th chapter, if you will, please. Exodus, the 13th chapter. We're going to make sure that you remember tonight all that God has done for you. 13th chapter of Exodus. Let's start with the third verse. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day. And what a great miracle. This was the Exodus. God's taking them out of Egypt. He said, remember this day. It's a day of deliverance. In which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. There will be no leavened bread be eaten. Go down to verse 14. And it shall be when thy son asked thee to, in time to come, saying, what is this that thou shalt say unto him? By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt, 
from the house of bondage. Verse 16, it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets before thine eyes. In other words, you'll wear this miracle. You'll wear this day. You'll remember every detail. You will remember. Now, folks, it says here, for frontlets between thine eyes and for for by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. Now, folks, the, the Pharisees took that literally and they made phylacteries. They were little boxes with these, uh, prom- they're like promise boxes. They were uh, pieces of the word that were in these boxes. They wrapped them around the hand and then they had around their forehead little boxes. And they took this literally for a token upon thine hand and thy the frontness between thine eyes. But see, this is a metaphor. The Lord, uh, the, the, the scripture, God is saying to them, Mentally, keep it in mind. Don't ever forget this miracle of deliverance. I am delivering you. Don't ever forget it. Tell it to your children, your grandchildren. And in times to come when you're in a hard place, you're in a crisis, remember this day of deliverance. Don't ever forget it. Remember it. Remember it. And it screams, literally screams all through the Bible to all God's people. Remember the deliverances. Remember. Don't ever forget what I've done for you. Keep a mental diary. Remember every detail and tell it. Bind it upon your faith. Build on it. No one saw greater miracles than the children of Israel. And you know that. My, the ten plagues. And none of the plagues come near, came near their dwelling. To see the firstborn die all through Egypt and not one of their children die because the blood on the doorpost. They, they were there when Pharaoh's army is coming against them and they're at the Red Sea and they're, they're all closed in and the clouds behind them. And suddenly, in the, before, it, it, it probably uh, just at even time, the cloud moves behind them. And they watch in amazement as the wind of God comes and dries up a path, builds the walls of the water of the Red Sea up on both sides. And they go all night long because there are nearly three million who took all night and they're marching. Could you imagine when they got on the other side, look at that big long line of people and those waters just hanging in space. And they're looking at this in utter amazement. One of the greatest miracles. What would you have done? What would you have done? Do you think you'd ever forget that as long as you live? When you're marching over, the armies are there. You thought you were going to die by Pharaoh's army. You thought you would never get across. And here are the walls. I, I can't tell you how high those wall, walls of water must have been. But the wind came and dried the ground so that their oxen and their cattle and, and their carts could go without, without sinking into mud. That's an amazing thing that... that uh, They're beholding. And then when the last priest is out of the water, you hear the rattling of the chariots. The cloud is lifted because God is now dragnetting the Pharaoh's army right into the Red Sea. And they're probably halfway through and the children of Israel are beginning to tremble. Oh, God! Because they're still full of doubt. And suddenly the walls start crashing in. And before the walls start crashing in, the wheels start coming off all the chariots. Can you imagine? They, they have come. It, it, it's many, many miles through the desert, and those chariot wheels never flew off. But the moment they get into the bottom of the Red Sea, off come the chariot wheels, and the horses are, are falling, and they're falling over one another. And suddenly the walls crash in, and they're over there, three million people over there, cheering and praising God because they're being swept away and God destroys the whole army of Pharaoh. Incredible miracle. You say, well, if I had been there, I would have never doubted the Lord in all those wilderness journeys. I would have not been like the children of Israel. You know what the Bible says of them? Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt, They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at this Red Sea, even the Red Sea. He said they provoked him even at the Red Sea. After the miracle had been accomplished, even after they had danced and everything else, doubts began to creep in. And you remember just a few days later when they they came to the 
where, where they were came to the waters of Merrill, they said there's no water, and they began to doubt him again. Yea, they turned back and tempted God. They limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand. No, the day when he delivered them from the enemy, how he wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders of Zoan and turned their rivers into blood. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. They forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous, terrible things by the Red Sea. The very thing that Moses chided them about. After they'd seen the miracles, he chided them. He says, you, you people are going to forget all this. You're going to be in a crisis, and you're going to doubt God. You're going to forget everything he's done. This is what the Scripture said. Take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul watchful. In other words, remember this. Remember every detail. Mark it down in your mind. Make it indelible. Don't forget what God has done miraculously for you because you're going to need it in the future. Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons, to your granddaughters and your grandsons. Teach what God has done for you. We are commanded to wear our deliverances in our memories, on our minds. Keep them at hand. How many miraculous miracles and answers to prayer are you wearing? How many of you remember all the details of what God has done for you in the past ten years or so? You know, I was embarrassed when the Lord asked me that. And I, I stopped. I could only remember the details of four or five spectacular things that he's done in the past. Those I, I did not replay them in my mind enough. I didn't tell them enough. I didn't tell my children, my grandchildren about all of these things as I should because telling them and retelling them plants it deeper into your heart and your mind. You remember all the way that he brought you, the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And I, 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 I was ashamed because I could only remember a few of these miracles that I kept the details of. They're just faint memories now. How many can you remember in all the details? How many could stand here tonight and get up and tell us all the details of the miracles that God has done since you were saved? I mean, outstanding miracles. And not a person here that hasn't had a miracle. Numbers of miracles. Well, you thought it was all over. You thought you were going to backslide and go back to hell. And God delivered you time and time and time again from temptation, from lust, from all kinds of problems. He delivered you. Why, why does God command us to remember? He said we're to remember past deliverances to increase our faith for our present struggles. To increase our faith in our present crisis. He says if you want faith to be built up what you're going through now, Go back and see what I've already done for you since you've been saved. It's for our own benefit, he says, that we're to remember. What kind of crisis are you facing right now? What kind of giant has come up against you and standing in front of you? The only way you can face your present giant is to remember the lion and the bear. Remember David. Coming against this great giant. In fact, go to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel. Folks, I, I want to build up your faith tonight. 1 Samuel 17. Remember, David comes to Saul says, I'll go fight you, giant. Saul's afraid. The whole army's afraid. Verse 32. 1 Samuel 17. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, I'm not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him without but a youth. And he a man of war from his youth. David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. There came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard or his fur. And I smote him and I slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them 
seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord, listen to me, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Folks, what kind of giant has come up against you? Is it your rent? Every month trying to put enough aside to pay the next month's rent and come short and the bills and the family problems and I don't know what kind of, of uh, giant has come against you. The Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He'll deliver me out of the hand of this giant. You, you ought to read the letters that we get. You talk about troubles. I'm just list a few of them. A, a couple grieving over a minister's son. This is an older couple and their son's a preacher. He left his wife and two children to run off with a homosexual. And gave up the ministry to go into the gay life and they are devastated. Especially because they don't know what's going to happen to the two grandchildren. The pastor and his wife wrote, and they're grieving over a daughter who was dying, and they prayed her back to health. Now she's on drugs. She ran off and married a young man who became a killer. Now he's in jail. She's losing control of her life, and she's talking of suicide. And this, they say, after we prayed her out of the jaws of death. A young mother wrote three children and she sits all alone in a little rented house. Her husband died just recently, left her with no insurance. She has no means of support. She is alone, lonely, and penniless, and is saying, what do I do now? In Oklahoma, a businessman wrote, being sued by a so-called Christian partner in his business. And this man is so intent on stealing his business this other man started it and brought a Christian brother in. Now he's trying to steal it. He took him to court, suing him, won't even talk to him, and the court's leaning toward the other man. And he said, I've done everything right, and yet everything seems to be turning wrong. A 55-year-old man wrote from Pittsburgh. He was laid off from a high-paying job. He said, no one wants to hire somebody 55 years old. I have debts. I, I have children I've been helping. And my children need help. He said, what I do, I'm so ashamed, I just, well, I can't go to work, so I just walk because I don't want to sit home doing nothing, but I have panic in my soul now. These are just a few of the giants that have been told to us, people facing giants. And some of you here tonight, you're facing giants in your home, your children, grandchildren, family, whatever it may be. There are giants. It may be a lust that you're fighting something uh, that's absolutely ruling, a, a ruling passion that's taking control of your life. could be finances. It could be so much. There's, there's a dear sister wrote the other day from this church. She's unemployed. She has no money. She doesn't know what she's going to do, but she does know that when she comes, I preached on wit's end, and the message touched her, and, and she said, I'm still believing God with all my heart. God is faithful. God is faithful. Now, these are just a few of the giants. But let me tell you something. If you are there now and you're up against a giant, will you stop and think of the lion and the bear? These were lesser. These were not as ferocious, perhaps, because, uh, now, to me, it would be, but uh, standing before a, a, an eight-foot giant, um, or a nine-foot giant, uh, this huge monster of a man, and uh, with just a slingshot, that there's something in David's heart that says, I serve a God who has delivered me all my life. I've been in one scrape after another. I've been in one hard place after another. And every time I've gone to him, one way or another, he has delivered me. He has set me free. And the God who's been delivering me in the past is going to deliver me today. He's going to deliver me right now. <clears throat> Do you remember what it was like before Jesus saved you? There was no deliverer. Do you remember all the hard times and the crisis that the devil likes to make you think, well, you go back, you had such a, such a ball, such a wonderful time. Boy, what a lie that is. 
It was a miserable time. You had no deliverer. But now that you've come to Jesus, boy, remember the miracle how he saved you. The miracle, just the miracle of saving you ought to give you faith for the rest of your life on any crisis. How many times since you've been saved, you've been delivered from temptation? How many of the husbands and wives, how many of the marriages are here that would not have survived if it had not been the delivering power of Jesus in your home and your lives? Well, the enemy came in like a flood, but the Holy Ghost raised up a standard. Do you remember it? Do you go back? Do you say, yes, I fought the lion, I fought the bear, and I'll fight this giant through the Holy Ghost. He's going to deliver me. Did you come close at one time to giving in and you thought, I'm going to blow it, I'm I'm not going to make it, I'm going to be damned and go to hell after all these struggles? And the Lord came to you and you look back, I don't know how he did it, but he brought me out. Here I am standing here. I'm still saved. I'm serving the Lord. It's been hard. I've gone through a lot of problems. I've been tried. I've been tested, but I'm still loving Jesus. I'm still standing here. How many prayers has he answered for you? My goodness. Let me tell you how to turn your giant into an ant. You can't do it here in New York City. You need to rent a car or take a bus or something and go out in the country, New Jersey. Better to go to Pennsylvania. And just go up on a country road where there are no street lights, no lights. And on a starry night, you look out at the millions and millions and millions of stars and the, and the moon and all the glory of God. And remember who you serve. He who hung all the stars in space. Charlie Duke, the astronaut, was in this church once, and he spoke to our young people, and he he told about being on that tiny spacecraft, 28,000 miles from Earth, and he was racing toward the moon, and they turned the craft sideways, and and everybody, look, and there was the Earth in the, uh, the, the, the light of the moon shining, just hanging in the blackness of space. There was that white ball, it was just overpowering. Brother Duke said, Charlie Duke said it was just an overpowering experience. Here it is, hanging in nothing. Folks, we're sitting on a globe that's hanging on nothing. And if God can hang the whole earth on nothing, he can deliver you from your giant. That's how God brought Job out. Job thought it was all over. But you know what God did? He took him out. Took him out on a starry night. You know, he said, the foundations of the earth, Job, to what is the earth fastened to? What holds it in space? Who shut up the seas? Who keeps the sea from overflowing the land? He said, why doesn't the sea just overflow the whole land? Who put the borders between the sea and the land? Where is the spring from which all the seas flow? Where did all this water come from? How was the light parted? How was the wind divided and scattered? How was the rain born? Who set all the forces of nature in place? Can man produce lightning and thunder and clouds and rain? Who put wildness and tameness in the animals? Why are some wild? Why are some tame? You can pat the dog, but you can't pat the snake. Why is it? You cannot pet a lion, but you can pet a cat. Who put the wildness in the team? Who did all these things? God said, look up and see the greatness and the majesty of God, and then look at your problem from his greatness. Hallelujah. You know what God was saying to Job? He said, Job, you forgot who I am. You accused me of neglecting you. You doubted my power. You doubted my concern for you. Yet I've shown you how I care for all my creatures. If I care for the sparrow that falls, if I count the very ants, if I count even the sands of the sea, do you think I can't keep you? Job cried out, I know you can do anything, O God, and that nothing can be held from you. Hallelujah. Secondly, 
would remember past deliverances as a weapon against all fear. It's a weapon against all fear. Fear cannot get a stronghold in your heart if you have a vision of the majesty and the greatness of God and if you remember his past deliverances. Nehemiah understood that principle well because they were rebuilding the walls. And boy, the people were weary. And this man, fear, had set in. It's very clear that that, that, that send out and told by these wicked men and the Arabians and all of the others that had gathered around, the Ashdodites, the Ammonites, the Arabians, trying to bring fear. And they have a trowel in one hand and a weapon in the other. They sleep in their clothes. They don't change their clothes. And there's rubbish everywhere. This man of God looks at this giant of a project. It looks absolutely impossible. And how does a man, looking at an impossible task, things look absolutely hopeless. God had told him to do it. He said, I'm with you. And this fear beginning to creep into his heart. And he goes out and he looks up to the sky. And he said, and I looked up and then I rose up. And then I said unto the nobles and to all the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and terrible and fight. Remember the Lord who is what? Great and terrible. In other words, majestic. Who can do any? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? That's the question asked in this book. Is there anything in your life too hard for him? Are you afraid? Is your problem getting to you now and shaking your confidence in the Lord? Let me show you how Moses dealt with this fear that tried to creep into his heart. He said, if thou so say in thine heart, these nations are stronger than I, or too much for me, how can I dispossess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but thou shalt remember, in fact, he said, but shalt well remember, well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and all of Egypt. Thou shalt not be afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible working wonders. The Lord Most High is terrible. He's a great king. He's, he's saying, now look at all the enemies. Look at the Philistines. Look at the Ammonites. Look at all of these that you're facing. He said, and I want you to look back and well remember what God did to your enemies before. And don't let fear come into your heart. Oh, folks, fear has torment. God, help us. Every day I wake up, first thing the Holy Ghost says to me every day, David, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Hallelujah. He's put a fearlessness in my heart. He says, don't be afraid. Hallelujah. Moses was saying, you're going to face many great enemies. They're going to be more powerful than you on the externally. You'll wonder how you're ever going to see victory. But all you have to do is remember how great and mighty your God is. Remember what he's done for you in the past. And let your faith rise and go fight. We first... Remind ourselves of how great he is, what he's done for us. Then we claim that power for our present moment. You say, God, you had power then. You're the same yesterday and today forever. I want your power now. I want to appropriate by faith your power for my present situation. Moses said, he is, the, he is thy praise and he is thy God that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. He said, God did all these things for you. That he, he would simply encourage your faith. He said, he's done all of these things. Folks, after all these years, you know, most of you know, I started preaching. I was called to preach when I was eight years old. And all my life, after studying this book, loving it, seeking his face, you know what I've come to the conclusion? If I wrapped it all up, the one thing God wants from all of us, the one thing he's been saying all through this book, through every preaching, through every service, through every worship, trust me. Trust me. That's what this is all about. Trust me. Just believe in me. Give me your childlike faith. Give me your confidence. I'll see you through. Give me your confidence. Are you locked into a besetting sin? Trust me. Call on me. I'll deliver you. Give me your faith. Give me your confidence. 
Are you having a difficult time financially? Continue to seek your, seek my face with all your heart. I'm not going to let you go begging for bread. You're not going to be out with a tin cup or a paper cup on the street. You're not going to be sleeping in a cardboard box. I'm going to take care of you. David said, what nation on earth is like unto your people to do for you, for them great things and terrible before thy people, which you have redeemed? God said, I am the Lord, I change not. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward him. You understand that? God is looking up and down. His eyes run through every seat in this congregation looking for a heart, looking for a Christian that says, God, I'll trust you. That's, I'm looking for someone like that so I can be strong on their behalf, so I can show my power. Oh, hallelujah. If you just believe that one verse, you wouldn't be able to sit as quiet as you're sitting right now. Moses' dying words, be strong and of good courage. Fear not nor be afraid. For the Lord thy God, he is, it is he that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee. He will not forsake thee. Folks, I, I, I trust in a dying man's words, especially a holy man like him. His last words, be strong, good courage, fear not, don't be afraid. The Lord your God, he it is that goeth with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. How many believe God's with you tonight? He's with you. God said, if I'm with you, if God be for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. Paul the Apostle prayed that the eyes of the saints in the New Testament would be open to the greatness of God's power. He said, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being opened or enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. He said, oh, if you could only have your eyes open to the power of God that's at work and available to you by faith. Hallelujah. Now, in closing, let me tell you some of the things I want to remember. He said, remember, well remember. I want to remember Lot's wife. How she turned back and died on the spot. I don't ever want to get attached to materialism like she did and lose it at the end. Lot's wife, I mean, it, when she turned a pillar, saw, it just means what he, God's trying to say, if you get into materialism, it's going to harden you. you. You get your eyes on materialism, it's going to harden you. It's going to turn you to stone. I'm going to remember Miriam and Aaron who rose up against the brother Moses. I'm going to remember so that I don't murmur and complain or gossip because she complained and turned leprous on the spot. I want to remember his righteous judgments. I want to remember the Lord's death till he comes. We do that at least 52 times a year here at Times Square Church. He said, remember. And that's what the Lord's table is all about. Remember. I don't ever want to forget the cross. Amen. I remember, and I'll never forget, five different occasions, five different surgeons who came out of an operating room at five different times with that downcast look and said, Reverend, I'm sorry, it's preg it, it's it's malignant. Five times my wife Gwen was in the, uh, for cancer, and I'll never forget one after another, five times, five different surgeons. Well, six, actually. Sorry, Reverend, it was malignant. And I remember time after time the deliverance. Doctors say, hopeless. And how God delivered and delivered and delivered and delivered and delivered. Three weeks ago, Gwen, again, horrible. She, she had been operated in, in back right about here, and they took a piece of a rib out. And this has been about five years ago, or, or longer than that. I don't remember the time exactly, but in the last three weeks, those pains, shooting pains, she screamed in agony for three weeks. Last week, I took her to Dallas. And she's, <clears throat> it, we took her there, and 
Three days ago, she had an MRI, screaming in pain. But it was absolutely clear, absolutely clear again. And yesterday, God took the pain away, just delivered the pain. I remember Debbie, my daughter, 27 years old, the same cancer that her mother had right here in her bowel, same spot. And then we gave her chemotherapy and ate a hole in her stomach. And as long as I live, I'll never forget going into the hospital and seeing her like a little baby, all wrapped up in a fetal position, just skin and bone. And the devil said, I'm going to take all your family. But she's well and alive. All these years. I remember it. And I will not forget it. I will not forget the crying, the agony. I won't forget all of that. But I'll never forget his delivering power. I remember the day my 17-year-old son Gary, still in high school, shook me from head to toe when he came home from school one day, called me in his bedroom and said, Dad, I don't believe God's there anymore. He doesn't seem real to me. I pray I have no faith. And I remember going to God and saying, Lord, I can't reach it. You'll have to do it. Of course, you know my son Gary's in the ministry today. He's started a church in Denver. It's doing great right now. I remember the day my... Teenage son, Greg, was in a head-on collision, and I received a call. Pastor Dave, come quick. Your son's been in a a head-on collision. His car is totaled. Jump in and race with my blood just draining out of me. And when I get to the scene and all the lights in the crowd and look at that car, I said, he's dead. A little tap on my shoulder. Turn around, there's Greg standing there. You think I'm going to forget that miracle? I'm not going to forget that day in Texas when we about to get into a van to pull away. My son-in-law, Roger, his two, two grandsons, my two grandsons are in the back seat. And we weren't in the van yet. It wasn't even started. And uh, Roger, who had been in the driver's seat, forgot something, went into the house. And little David, just a little thing, crawled up, pushed the lever into neutral. Car went down the hill, slammed into a house. We came out in that thing. And I raced down and said, oh, God, what now? And I opened the door, and he's giggling. Not a scratch. I'm not going to forget the angel of the Lord who camped around about that little boy. Never. I'm not going to forget when I was eight years old at a camp meeting. You know, I went back this past year and I nailed at that same spot when I was eight years old when the Holy Ghost came upon me and dear brother Chase, daddy Chase, laid hands upon me, gray-haired man, uh, uh, and, and... he he wasn't great at that time, but he laid hands on me and said, Oh, God, you have a ministry for this boy. Use him. I'll never forget his touch. That miracle is the reason I stand here tonight. I'm not going to forget that. That's been years ago, and I'll never forget that. I keep reminding it. I, go, I went back there and knelt and just cried and wept because the same anointing was on me that he gave me when I was eight years old. I'll never forget a call tonight at 6.30. As you know, my daughter Bonnie had, had uh, three years ago had operation for cancer, uteral, uterine cancer, and they gave her 30% chance to survive. And they implanted, literally implanted a uh, uh, thing in her that you, you couldn't even go in the room. It had to be leaded and everything else, implanted it. And I remember her doctor, lady, saying, Reverend, the best hope is 30, 30% chance of survival. It'll break out left and right. Well, two months ago, they found five spots on her liver. 
and uh, that's two months ago, and she went in this morning for a uh, CAT scan. And uh, she said, I had called her last night, and she said, Daddy, whatever God wants. And I had laid her down. When she got cancer uh, the first time three years ago, it so broke my heart. And I went out into a country road on the border of Mexico because it was El Paso. And I, for three, two, three hours, I just screamed at God and cried. I said, God, not as my wife and Debbie and now Bonnie. It's too much. I said, I don't know what to do. And he, he, you remember I told you, the Lord said, Bonnie's got two fathers, you and me. Which one of us has the power? I said, you do. Which one of us knows what's best for Bonnie? I said, you do. He said, will you put her in my hands from this day on and trust me that I will give her life as long as I think she should live and I will do for her what is best for her, not for you, but for her because I love her. She, I'm her father. I've loaned her to you, but I'm her father. I literally gave her over and never took her out of the father's hand to that. And I called her last night and I prayed and said, honey, I gave you into the father's hands and I'm not going to take you out. Whatever I say, amen, God has the power. He has the authority. He's able to do it. I got a call at 630, her test this morning, and it was all clear. <laughs> You see, you know what I'm doing? I'm doing what he said. Remember it and tell it. Tell it to your children, your grandchildren. Tell it and retell it. And as you're telling it, remind yourself how faithful God is. Now, some of you have been wavering in your faith. Some of you have been shaken. And God's trying to encourage you tonight. He sent a pastor here to this pulpit tonight to remind you, to remember the pit from which you've been dug, the faithfulness of God, and he is not going to fail you. Will you stand? Hear, hear my word, precious ones. Hear the word of the Lord. Have I not seen your tears? Have I not bottled every tear you've shed? Have I not seen... The enemy come against you, trying to claim you, trying to hurt you. And yet, do you not know that you are mine and not his? That you belong to me, and I will not fail you in your time of need. I've heard the cry of your heart. I've heard even the whispering. I've heard the yearning. I've heard the pain and felt your pain. And I've come tonight by my word to bring healing to your spirit healing to your mind. I will bless you if you will simply lay it on me. Take it off your shoulder and put it on mine. And trust me and believe me. And see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there be no room to contain it. So lift your hearts, lift your faith, give it to me, and I will deliver you this night. Hallelujah. Lord, I believe you, and I trust you. Hallelujah. I want you to lift your hands. Folks, going to turn the whole church into an altar. Just lift up your hands. And I want you to just begin to remind God that he's been faithful to you. Say, Lord, you've been faithful to me. You've never failed me. You've been good to me. And praise him for his faithfulness. Thank him for his faithfulness. Lord, you've been good to us. You've delivered us in the past. We praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you for your goodness and your mercy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What a merciful God you have been to us. We give you thanks. We give you thanks. We give you thanks for your multiplied mercies. You've been good to us. You're not going to fail us. We turn everything into you. Turn it all over to you. Off our shoulders onto your shoulders. For he careth. Casting all your care on him. For he careth for you. Cast your care. 
Cast your care on him. Casting all our care upon him, for he careth for us. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. I'd like everybody in this church tonight to raise your hands and pray this prayer corporately together. Pray this from the depths of your heart. Oh, Jesus, I thank you that I can say tonight to the whole world, God is faithful. He's been faithful to me. He's been faithful to my heart. He's delivered me in the past. And Jesus, I commit myself to trusting you to deliver me now. I need help now. And you are with me. And if God is for me, all the devils of hell, all the demon powers cannot destroy me. Keep me in the palm of your hand and give me your faith. I trust you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I trust you, Jesus. I believe you. We believe you, oh God. Hallelujah. 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 This is the conclusion of the message.